computer. Um, I don't know if anybody's watching yet, but we're just doing a quick test. Um, you might have to refresh your page. If anybody's watching at this point, welcome. I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> Three minutes. Hi, Deb. Erica. Hi, Erica. My sister Nancy, whose idea this was, hasn't logged in yet. Sherry Berman. Hi, Sherry. Two minutes and we're going to get started. And diamonds and Michelle. Lisa Colaruso. Sue Ann, Michelle, Lisa, thanks for joining us this morning. And again, my sister Nancy, whose idea this was, still has not logged in. She is in so much trouble. There she is. Oh, good. Here she is. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Tiffany Doge. John and Tiffany, Stevens. thanks for. And who? John. Oh, hi, John. So far, the people that I know and trust, so this isn't so bad. <laughs> I'm really not nervous about the demo. I'm more nervous about who might be watching. <laughs> Fucking Wally. <laughs> okay, so for those of you that are already signed in, you're welcome to type in questions. My husband is behind the camera, my lovely assistant, and he's going to read questions to me. He's also going to let me know who's um, signed in and who's watching so I can, you know, give you a quick hello. Um, the first thing we're going to do because this is brunch is open something to drink because, well, I need it. And uh, I don't like the color pink unless it has bubbles in it. So we're going to start here. Get yourself a cocktail. One for me, one for my homie. I'm trying not to shake too much because I'm a nervous wreck. So if you're wondering what I'm drinking, that's it. I hope you can see the label. Cheers, everybody. Enjoy. Chin chin. Okay. Delish. Okay. So the first thing you're going to want to do in setting up your croque madame or your croque monsieur, if you are not using the egg, is 
Take your milk. I'm using four cups. I told you four to six because you're going to have plenty of sauce left over and I'll tell you what to do with that at the end. And every time you do this, there is moisture in flour and in butter, so it will alter the thickness of your sauce. Not a lot at a volume like this, but it can affect it in larger volumes. So we're going to turn our saucepan onto medium low. We're going to put our whole milk into the saucepan. And you want it on medium low for a couple of different reasons. One, if you bring the milk to a boil, it's going to boil over, make a mess all over your stove. And we don't want it hot, we just want it warm. So I'm going to turn that down just a little bit more. And while we're waiting for our milk to get warm, we're going to start making our roux. So we're going to put our pan on. And now we're in our larger saucepan. I'm using a four quart stock pot just because it's what I like. And we're going to do it kind of on medium. You want to melt your butter. Now you can use whole butter. You can use ghee. You can use clarified butter. Um, and it doesn't matter at this point whether it's salted or unsalted because this is just home cooking. This isn't restaurant cooking. It's a restaurant dish that I'm teaching you how to make at home, okay? So we're gonna put, I already have a little bit of butter in my pan because I had some left over. We're gonna put about three tablespoons in. And you gotta use real butter. You cannot use margarine. It's just, you just can't. It's, You've had a lot of people join in, so recap what you're doing. Okay, so for all of you who are just joining in and just got logged in, we're heating up our milk on medium low so it does not come to a boil, okay? We've started melting our butter in our um, larger saucepan or stock pot. Do you want to do a, a list of ingredients just to recap for everybody what they need to have? Now you should already have, my husband's giving me some tips here, you should already have your ingredient list. Uh, if you can look behind me, you could see I've got my sandwich fixings here, I have my egg right here, and basically for the sauce, we're already started. Okay, so we're heating up our milk, we're melting our butter. Now we're gonna add in some flour. And again, you wanna do equal parts flour and butter. And again, real butter, not margarine. Once your butter is melted and it's starting to look a little foamy, that's when you wanna add in your flour. See, mine's not starting to foam yet. And then you got to get your whisk out. You'll notice I've got all my tools ready to go. Okay, flour goes on in. And you want to whisk right away. And you're going to whisk this constantly until your roux starts to look like sand. And you don't want it to get any color in it. It should still stay the color of butter. Because we're making a white sauce, we don't want our roux to brown. Now, if we were doing a velouté, which is a fancy word for gravy, or if we were doing uh, gumbo, for example, we would want a much darker roux, but we want this one to be blonde. Okay, some of your folks are behind uh, because they're using electric stoves, so it's taking them a little longer. Okay, for those of you that are doing, um, they're working with electric stoves, I'm just going to slow down here a little bit. I prefer a gas stove um, when we were shopping. What if you don't have a whisk asking for a friend? <laughs> <laughs> what if you don't have a whisk asking for a friend? Um, wow. Um, use a spatula that's safe for your pan um, and just stir, stir, stir. You're going to have problems um, getting the lumps out of your sauce without a whisk, but. You know what? This is Quarantine Kitchen. Work with what you got. Okay, so you see how this is starting to foam and bubble? That's what it's supposed to look like. What about a fork head? You could use a fork head if your pan is not too deep and you're not worried about burning your hand. And my milk is almost warm enough. DKB and uh, EMA 
rock and roll. DKB. David Banks. Hi, Dave Banks. Hi, Ian. I'm drinking again. Sorry. And, and so is um, Zach. Oh, Zach, my cooking and eating buddy. Thanks for tuning in. Disco's on. Ellie's on. Hi, Ellie. Who did you say before, Ellie? Disco. Disco. Oh, my mom. Hi, mom. My mother has seen me cook. So, just so you know, I've done over a thousand live demos in my time. It has been almost six years since I've done my last one. Uh, some of you who are watching have already seen me do one multiple times, sober and drunk. Uh, this is a little nerve-wracking, to be totally honest with you. Okay. Check the temperature of your, of your milk. Just stick your finger in. If it feels like a warm bath, you're just about ready to go. Remember, you don't want it boiling. Okay. My roux is starting to get a little brown, so we're gonna add our milk in. So, you wanna do this gradually. You can hear it hissing. And it's gonna start to look like this. See how it's starting to look like a- Further, further. It's starting to look like a Play-Doh. That's normal. When you get it, all the milk incorporated, add a little bit more and just keep whisking. Or for those of you without a whisk, just keep stirring. Now the reason we heated the milk first is twofold. One, we don't want to cool down our roux. We want to keep our roux at a good temperature. But two, it helps reduce the number of lumps that you're gonna to have to deal with later. <coughs> now this is, and when I went to culinary school, yes I did go, um, this is the basis for what's one, called one of the mother sauces, which is bechamel. So when you get done with this, congratulations, you will have made your bechamel. And for some of you, it won't be a first. For some of you, it'll be a repeat. My sister Nancy has made this numerous times, make a macaroni and cheese. And when you've got leftover sauce, I'm going to tell you what to do with it at the end. Because you may have leftover sauce, depending on how saucy you want your sandwich to be. Now, when it comes to bechamel, there's, I don't like mine really thin. It should be, it should coat the back of a spoon, okay? I've put in right now about two and a half cups of milk, and mine's a little thin, but it's going to cook down. Remember, it's going to cook a little bit on the back burner. Okay, so when your sauce starts to look like a thin clam chowder, you can stop stirring, lower your heat, and then we're going to do the optional part that I told you about. Now, in a restaurant... Carrie, Hanscom, Becky, Tate. Hi, Becky. Oh, no. Becky actually went to... Um, Look out on blue in, in London. So Becky, I apologize for everything I'm about to be doing. So when you go to a restaurant and you have a bechamel sauce, they always do something called an onion pique. So in order to make our onion pique, I cut my onion top to bottom and I left the root intact for a reason. Okay? We're going to take a piece of this onion. I told you a quarter, but this onion's really big. So I'm just doing a piece about this big. Okay? We're going to take a bay leaf and we're going to stick it between the leaves of the onion, okay? And then we're gonna hold it in place with a clove. Just a regular, you know, clove that you stick in um, yeah. baking. Yeah. And you're just gonna kinda hold that bay leaf in place, okay? And drop it in, okay? And you're gonna stir your sauce again. This is one of those things where you've got to keep an eye on it. Because you don't want it to stick to the bottom of the pan and burn and make your sauce brown. Because we want a nice white sauce. My sauce is starting to get thick. So what the onion pique is going to do is it's going to give your sauce a little bit of flavor. 
and you're going to strain it out later, so don't worry about it. And I'm going to add a little bit more milk because my sauce is starting to thicken up. I think that's all I'm going to need. Okay, so... We're going to move that to the back burner and switch it to low. You kind of want to, I don't know if you can see it, John might have to tilt the camera. I'm setting my um, pan off kind of at an angle so that it creates a circular motion. The heat on the bottom is going to make the sauce work in a circular motion and kind of help move it around. If it's right underneath the center, it's just going to heat the middle. If you put it off to the side, it creates this circular motion in the pan. Just use your physics, people. And it's, uh, it's going to help stir it itself. Okay, time for another drink. <laughs> Any questions so far? No, we're good? All right. Well, you remember you're on a delay. I know, John, just inform me there's a slight delay. About 30 seconds, actually. Okay. But uh, you've had Jennifer Coconor. One of John, Nancy's friends, Jennifer, is on. Patrice. Thanks. Hi, Patrice. Uh, Rachel Lawrence Coons, Suzanne Diamond. Sue Ann. Hi, Sue Ann. Hi, my niece Erica and my only godchild is watching. Marcella Russell. Oh, man. There's a lot of people watching this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to um, add a little bit of seasoning to our bechamel. We're gonna take just a pinch of kosher salt. Now a pinch is, you know, depends on how big your fingers are, but I use my two main fingers and my thumb, and that's like less than a quarter of a teaspoon. And then we're gonna put in some freshly grated pepper. Now, there's a lot of people in the culinary world who would never put black pepper in here because they don't like the way it looks. That's fine. If you have white pepper and you want it, go ahead and use it. I like white pepper, even though it's technically not pepper, but because it's got a lot more floral um, components to it and it's not quite the same spice as black pepper, but we're gonna use the black pepper because that's probably what most of you have. And you probably just want three or four grounds in there. And we're gonna mix that in. Your sister Tina needs a shout out. Hi, Tina! <laughs> My sister Tina needs a shout out, I have been informed. Tina's actually a pretty good cook. Her mom was an excellent cook and taught me a ton in the kitchen. And if this goes well, and if um, this has a good response, I may, in fact, teach you all how to make Grandma Nettie's world famous chicken salad. It is the most requested recipe. People are always asking me to make it. Always, always, always. So now to finish up our seasoning for our bechamel, we're gonna use nutmeg. Now, the trick with nutmeg, I'm using fresh nutmeg, so if you don't know what freshly grated nutmeg looks like, it looks kind of like a pecan, or for those of you in the south, the pecan looks like that. I don't know if you could see it. How's that visual, John? It's good. Okay. When you start grating it, it kind of looks like a brain on the inside. Don't worry. It's supposed to look like that. Okay, so you want the finest grater you own. If you're using freshly grated nutmeg, you only need two or three swipes. If you're using pre-grated nutmeg that's in the jar, you want a bare pinch. If you can taste the nutmeg in your sauce, you put too much in, what it's gonna do is literally alter the flavor imperceptibly, but if it's not in there, you'll know. And that's all the seasoning that this sauce gets. It's that simple. Congratulations, you just made a bechamel. Okay, and you just wanna keep checking on this and stirring and making sure it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pot. Now, I know when mine is ready, 
when it coats the back of a spoon and it leaves a ribbon, not gloppy. If it's gloppy, put some more milk in it. If it's too thin, wait for it to cook down. Genius. But you see how that coats the back of the spoon? Is that in, in film? Mm -hmm. See how it coats the back of the spoon? That's perfect. Janice Gregorio. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay, so let's put our nutmeg away. Let's put our butter away. Nancy Sino's on now. Oh, hi, Nancy. Not Sister Nancy, Nancy Sino. Okay, any questions at this point? No? Okay. So, get out your heavy bottom skillet. Is your sister Nancy saying her sauce is thin? Nancy, if your sauce is thin, mix, 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 mix. Keep it on the heat. It should start to bubble. Can you guys see that mine is slightly bubbling? I it's very slightly bubbling, and a light skim may form on the top. Don't panic. Just stir, 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 stir. And it, as it cooks, remember... It's actually Amy Mockler, not Ian. Hi, Amy. <laughs> um, as it cooks, moisture is going to be released in the form of steam. So your sauce is going to get thicker. So you don't, you know, don't panic. We're not ready to use it yet. And scrape the sides while you're doing this to make sure that your flour stays in the sauce because it will climb up the sides as you're whisking or stirring. And just so you know, this is a real house. This is my real kitchen. And there are real live dogs that may or may not start barking at any time. <laughs> Randy Ritchie, Marie Laferrette Clark. Oh, Marie Laferrette's watching. Great, Marie, thanks. You also went to culinary school and are a real chef. Uh, hi, Randy, how are you? Give the kids a squeeze for me and give my love to your husband. Okay. So now we're going to start working on assembling our sandwich. Now, traditionally, the way I have had croque madame and croque monsieur, it's done on brioche. But I didn't think anybody was going to be able to find sliced brioche in the grocery store right now. But lo and behold, I got sliced brioche. If you're working with white bread, don't panic, it'll be fine. Remember, this is quarantine kitchen. This is working with what you have available, what is easily accessible, and you can, you. here's the thing. Basically what we're making is a fancy grilled ham and cheese sandwich with a little sauce and a fried egg on top. So you can literally use any bread you want. But the square bread looks nicer. You can use whole grain. You can use spent grain. I wouldn't use rye. Eh, because it doesn't work with the sauce. you know. But any bread that you like is fine. I suggested plain white bread because I think it was going to be easy for everybody to get. All right. So I did not pre-grate my cheese because I wanted to talk with you about grating cheese a little bit. Um, when you're working with a semi-hard cheese like this, you can grate it straight out of the refrigerator and it's fine. If you decide that you're going to grate some mozzarella, for example, which is very soft, you want that shit cold because otherwise it's just going to get gummed up in your grater and make it more difficult for you. If you're working with really hard cheeses like Pecorino, Asiago, Parmesan, Grana Padana, any one of those hard cheeses, bring it up to room temperature. It'll be so much easier for you to grate. Your hand will end up cramped and you will be a much happier person. So I happen to like microplane um, grating tools. The other one that I used was also microplane. These two happen to come from the Pampered Chef, but you can find them in Sur La Table, you can find them in um, Williams-Sonoma, any really great kitchen store. The thing about the microplane blades is A, they're made in the US, yippee ki -yay. B, they're stainless steel, so they're gonna stay nice. C, they're dishwasher safe. You had a couple other people join, Kathy Davis. <clears throat> oh, Kathy Davis, hi. Wendy. Hi, Wendy, you? Oh no, 
Wendy, you're not allowed to watch. <laughs> Her husband is one of my favorite chefs here in Las Vegas, by the way. So, John, you want to tilt this down a little bit so that people can see what I'm doing here? All right. So, I like a pretty cheesy croque madame, and her husband also makes a fabulous croque madame, by the way. For those of you who don't live in Vegas and are planning on getting out here, you want to go to Sparrow and Wolf. My sister Nancy will totally jump on board with telling you that. Um, her husband is amazing. Wendy's amazing, too, but Brian, like, feeds my body. So he's good. All right, so I like a lot of cheese. You'll see that that's, this is probably about three to four ounces of cheese because I'm a cheesy kind of girl. So this was also an optional ingredient. This is not traditional on a croque madame or a croque monsieur, but I happen to like it. So we're just gonna take a very thin, 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 can you see how little that is? Schmear of Dijon mustard, just because I like it, okay? Any old Dijon will do. This one happens to be um, Miley, M-A-I-L-L-E, or Maye, however you pronounce it. Um, not like Miley Cyrus. You're going to put half of your cheese on the bottom. Let's go back to whisking for a sec. Because we want to make sure nothing sticks to the bottom. Nancy said, how many slices of cheese? Uh, it depends on how thick your cheese is and how cheesy you want your sandwich. You need to repeat the question because I don't know. Okay, Nancy, sister Nancy asked me how many slices of cheese. So it depends on how thick your cheese is and how cheesy you want your sandwich. If it's traditional, like deli thin slice, you probably want to do two on the bottom and then two on the top or two on the bottom and one on the top. If it's the thick kind, like Sargento that you buy in the grocery store dairy case, those are kind of thick. I'd probably do like one and a half. All right, when it comes to ham, there's a lot of different ones out there. This one happens to be Boar's Head Applewood Smoked. Denise Mills Wheeler, Michelle Wiley. Oh, hi, Mickey. Hi, Denise. All right. I like my ham wicked thin, like one step up from shaved. Um, I have had this done with beautiful country hams, which are sliced a lot thicker. I just think it makes it a little harder to cut through and chew. Um, again, this is all up for interpretation. There's no real measurement on your ham. I gave you estimates. And approximations. I like to. Sue Reynolds is on. Hi, Sue. Sue is my oldest friend from being married. Sue was the very first married friend I had. John and I were stationed with her and her husband Tom when we lived in Denver, and uh, our husbands were in school together, so uh, we had to like get along one way or the other, <laughs> and it just so happened that we got along beautifully. And we have been friends for more than 30 years. So that's kind of cool. There's a lot of people watching that I actually went to high school with. So that's kind of shocking. They've known me since before I had boobs, which is, you know, <laughs> a while ago. Okay. And so I've got my ham in there. I've got my cheese in there. Now I'm going to top it off with some more cheese. And this Gruyere smells so good. So the big difference between Gruyere and Swiss a, Gruyere does not have holes in it, okay? Two, <laughs> it's nuttier tasting and a little bit deeper and a little bit sharper. You can use either. I just think that whenever you have a good excuse to use Gruyere, you should because it's a little bit, it's significantly more expensive. Let's not lie. Um, but it's just the flavor is, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like it. Okay, so my sandwich is ready. Bada bing, bada boom. We're going to take our heavy bottomed uh, skillet that we're going to cook the sandwich in and just keep stirring your sauce. Now see, mine is thickening up a little and I still have a little bit of milk in here, so I'm just going to dump it on in. If your sauce isn't thickening, don't panic. You've got some more time. Any questions so far? Shelly 
Miss Basari says, I can see your towel. Good. Which towel is it? <laughs> the one that says, eat up bitches, or the one that says, you can't handle vermouth? <laughs> okay. I have a, um, a penchant for um, saucy, sassy kitchen stuff. This is one of my towels. This is my oven mitt. <laughs> this is my filthy oven mitt. <laughs> and if you want some really cool stuff, you can go to blueq.com and they make some really hilarious stuff in the kitchen. Okay, so we're gonna turn on our skillet. And again, I cook this sandwich on low. Karen Shalita wants to know will skim milk work? Karen Shalita wants to know if skim milk, skim milk will work. I specified whole milk because skim milk is too thin. 2% will work, um, but you're gonna have to add a lot more roux to get a skim milk sauce to thicken. It'll work, but you're gonna lose what you were trying to save in calories, you're gonna lose by having to add more roux. So yeah, it'll work, but you're not saving yourself any calories by using it because you're gonna end up having to use more roux to get the sauce to the right thickness. Does that answer the question? Remember, we're on a 30 I know, I'm on a delay. Sorry. And Nancy asked if you put the mustard on or is it for later? Oh, Na which Nancy? Nancy's Nancy, sister. sister. Sister Nancy, I put the mustard in a very, very, very thin coating on the one piece of bread before I started building my sandwich. So let me just run through the sandwich build again. Take your bread, two slices, top and bottom. On one very thin schmear of Dijon mustard. A layer of Gruyere or Swiss, whatever you're using. Your ham, more cheese. If you didn't put your mustard on the bottom, here's an opportunity for you to put it on the top slice. Put your top on and just gently tamp it down because you want everything to hold together. Now, I cook my grilled cheese on very low because I want my cheese to melt, I don't want my bread to burn, and my kitchen and my stove is wicked hot. So I wait for my pan to get a little bit warm. I tossed in my scraper, I really need it again. Because we're gonna use more butter. This is not a low-cal recipe, okay? Just saying, not a low-cal recipe. This is my very favorite brunch dish ever, and I have made it exactly zero times. We are making this together. I have never made this in my own home. This is one of those things that I go, ooh, we're going out to brunch, I'm having a croque madame. If croque madame's on the menu, that's what I'm having. And I'm gonna tell you, here in Vegas, the one at Bouchon that I had the picture of, that is the Mac Daddy of all of them. Thomas Keller, first of all, is a friggin' genius. Second of all, he only hires geniuses, like Wendy's husband, and my friend Dan Ontiveros. And they make the best, the best croquemont. And our friend Christine Grounseth. Oh, and my friend Christine Grounseth, who worked for Thomas Keller in Miami. Okay, couple of questions out there. Couple um, of questions, go for it. Jim Shield wants to know if there's anything in the heavy bottom pan yet. In this one, in the back? I don't know. Okay, Jim, I don't know when you chimed in. So, this back pan was, he asked what was in the bottom, what was in the heavy bottom pan. In this pan, we heated up our milk. In this one, we made our bechamel, which is on the stove, thickening up. Which Erica wants to know what's with the onion. The onion is seasoning the sauce, and we're gonna strain it out, okay? So you should have had your onion pique, which is your onion with the bay leaf shoved in between the leaves of the onion, and a clove to hold it in place, a pinch of salt, a couple of grinds of black pepper, and a quick shave of nutmeg in there. Okay, did you butter the... I have not done anything with this because I'm waiting for it to come up to heat. That's what you, that's what Jim... That's the pan Jim wanted to know about. Nope, there's nothing in here yet. I'm waiting for it to come up to temp. Because I want to put the butter in and uh -huh. I want it to immediately start to melt and bubble before I put my sandwich in. Julie Calloway. Hi, Julie Calloway. Julie Calloway was my very first friend here in Las Vegas. And she gives amazing, 
amazing directions to anywhere. What was that? There's 44 people watching this. Holy crap. Okay. So we're going to take a goodish amount of butter. Now, I'm not... I've lost 50 pounds. So I don't eat like this all the time. But in the middle of all this quarantine nonsense and self-isolation, we're all kind of craving a little bit of comfort food. And for me, this is definitely a comfort food. Okay, so we've got our butter in. We want to swirl it around the pan so it's looking well coated. If you're making two sandwiches, you can do them both at the same time. Um, John and I are going to share this <laughs> because we've got some uh, heavy calorie dinner plans tonight and tomorrow. So we're going to share this. See how it's starting to bubble? That's a good thing, to quote Martha Stewart. Because we're gonna take our sandwich, drop it right down in, and just let it sit. Don't fuck around with it. Don't move it. Don't play games with it. Just leave it alone. It's fine. Maureen Crow now is now on. Hi, you're Maureen. To, you're up to 46. Oh, God. John, don't tell me the number. <laughs> you can tell me the number later. <laughs> So when I set this up, just so you know, this was my sister Nancy's idea because for years, Nancy has called me and said, hey, I'm trying to make this, but I don't have that. What can I substitute? Or I've got X in my pantry. What do I do with it? Hey, I found this cool thing at the grocery store. What do I do with it? Okay, if I'm making this, what do I need to know? So I have been teaching her to cook by the phone for a decade. Speaking of, Nancy wants to know the burner that the sandwich is on. What do you It's on so? low. In case you missed it, my sandwich is on low. Your sister just isn't paying attention. I, Nancy is not paying attention or there's a delay or there's getting... There's a disconnect. A <laughs> disconnect or it's pixelating or whatever. Um, so I'll just repeat a couple of things. I cook my grilled cheese on low because I want the outside to be golden and crispy. If you do it too high, your outside's gonna cook before your inside is melted. I do not cover it because that makes the bread get soggy. Nancy's complaining you're moving too far. <laughs> okay, so I'm moving a little too fast. I'll slow down. I'll pour some more rosé. Because remember, she's on electric, so. Okay, so for those of you on electric, your pan should be heated to low. Your sauce, you should be stirring it like every few minutes just to make sure nothing's sticking to the bottom of the pan. And see how on my whisk, it's starting to get cloggy? That's normal, don't panic. Just beat it back into the sauce. Kim Madison is on. Hi, Kim. I went to school, my maid of honor is Kim's uh, cousin. Walter's asking how much flour goes in the sauce. Walter, you had your measurements. I sent you the list. It's three ounces of butter, three ounces of flour, or three tablespoons of butter, three tablespoons of flour. Whenever you're making a bechamel or you're making a roux, it's equal parts flour and butter. It doesn't matter if you're weighing it or you're measuring it. If you're using eight ounces of butter, you're using eight ounces of flour, you're going to need a whole shit ton more milk than what we're using here. And Becky Tate wanted to remind and butter both sides of the bread. Oh, yeah. I, I don't butter my bread. I butter the pan. And then I put when I go to flip this, I'll be putting more butter into the pan and flipping it in there. I don't like to butter the bread. I don't want to touch it when it's buttered. It's a personal thing. If you like to butter your bread, Becky, knock yourself out. Anybody else who likes to butter their bread, knock yourself out. I don't like to touch it. So I'll be buttering the pan twice. Once for the bottom and once for the top. Zach wants to know how much is a shit ton. <laughs> Zach wants to know how much is a shit ton. Well, a lot more than what we're working with today. John, do you need more rosé? I'm fine. Okay. 
Okay, any other questions? Because this is, we're almost done now, you guys. Seriously, this is like, we're going to, when we flip the sandwich over, we're going to start to work on our egg. For those of you that are doing croque, madame, for those of you that are doing croque monsieur, you're going to be almost done. Okay. I don't know why madame has the egg, except, well, we make eggs. Um, that would probably be the reason, yeah. What? That would probably be the <laughs> My husband says that's probably the answer. Okay, so let's get our garnish for the sandwich ready. I'm gonna use some fresh flapping parsley. Shelly Spisari, want, she was inquiring about the uh, spatula that you're using. Where did you get it from? <laughs> Shelly, you know. For those of you that don't know, I was a Pamper Chef sales director for 17 years. This is a no, Pamper Chef spatula. The, this this is also a Pamper Chef product. Um, you can get something like this at Sir La Table, though. It has a silicone bottom which is pan safe up to 400 degrees or 600 degrees depending on the maker and this just is a spreader side vic just joined in vic Holmes. hi vic vic is one of the most amusing people i know okay so when it comes to working with parsley if you're making a stock or something where you're going to strain it out Use your stems because they've got tons of flavor. But we're going to use garnish. So we're just going to pick off the very top tender stems and the leaves. And we don't need a whole ton of it. Now, when it comes to chopping herbs, you want to make sure your herbs are washed, duh. And you want to make sure that they are dry. Because, mm, we're going to make noise here. Um, if you chop herbs, especially basil, when it's wet, it makes them bitter. So we're gonna, we don't want this super fine. We kind of want it a little coarse. And for those of you that are asking, this is a shoe knife that my darling husband bought for me. You gotta love a man who buys his wife knives. And if you're asking about my cookware, the pan that we're making the sandwich in is from a company called uh, Made In. And the one that we're gonna cook the egg in is one from Mason. Okay, not super fine, can you guys see that? It's kind of a little chunky. And you'll notice that I don't have a lot of green on my cutting board. That's two reasons, one, my knife is sharp, and two, the herbs were dry. Oh, it looks beautiful. Okay, so now it's time for me to add more butter. And if you get a little cheese in the pan, it's not going to hurt anything. See? And again, this is home cooking. This is not restaurant cooking. So it's not perfectly golden brown. I'm not freaking out because we're going to cover it with sauce. All right. So for those of you who took the optional uh, list and got yourself a sieve, if your sauce is to the thickness that you want it, get ready to use your sieve. If your pot that you cooked your milk in is empty, that you used all your milk, you can just strain your sauce right back into there. If it's not, you can use the bowl. That's why I gave you both. Autumn is screaming hi at you. Oh, my, my grandniece Autumn is screaming hello, Aunt Lynn. <laughs> okay, so let's again, here's my sauce. See how it runs in a nice ribbon? Can you see that? Nice. And it coats the spoon beautifully. Perfect. I'm going to turn this down just a little bit. All right. I have these little silicone ears so I don't have to deal with the towel. Okay. So we're going to put our fine mesh suit in. See, that's pretty fine. It's not a colander. It is a fine mesh sieve. 
I'm going to put that on here. And we're going to pour our sauce in there. And what this is going to do, it's going to, first of all, strain out our onion and all the things from the onion piquet. But it's also going to help us get out any lumps that formed. Rick wants to know what hemp is the sauce. Um, I don't know. Restate so Vic wants to know what the temperature is on the sauce. I don't know the answer to that. I, I just don't. Um, I do a lot of cooking by feel. Um, because that's to me the best way to, um, make sure everything's right. You'll know it shouldn't be boiling. It should only be at a bare simmer. So if you've got that thing where it's bubbling voraciously, turn the temp way down. Because that's a good, fine way to burn your sauce. Okay, can you see how my onion is in there and then the pieces of the clove that broke off were in there and all the lumps, they all stayed in there. Now my sauce is really smooth. It's really nice and thin. It's not a big gloppy mass. See how it falls in a nice ribbon? Caprice is in, Tom Reynolds is in. Oh, he meant nice. on the burn, Vic meant on the burn or keeping it at low or center. Yes, it yeah. should be on low, Man, for sure. Better. Keep your sauce on low as much as possible. So I'm just gonna move this to the back burner. It's hot, I'm not putting a flame underneath it. I'm gonna get this out of my way and dump it in the sink. Okay, so now we're going to talk about an egg. Guess what? We're going to use more butter. <laughs> now, when you're doing eggs, there's a lot of conversation about there, out there about cooking, about egg cookery. I mean, uh, Julia Child had an entire like book, basically, about egg cookery. So... If you're making an omelet, you can kind of do that at a higher temperature. Since we're gonna want our egg sunny side up, we want this on low because we don't wanna have our whites cook unevenly. We want them to cook so that the white is cooked and that the yolk is still runny. Okay? Kim Kiley's on now too. Oh my goodness gracious. Don't tell me the number. Okay, so I'm putting a little bit of butter in. Um, it's a non-stick pan. Non-stick is best for eggs. I don't use a lot of non-stick other than this. Um, I am a stainless steel and cast iron girl. Oh, that's looking really nice. Now you can see my cheese, I'm mashing it down just a little bit. Um, my cheese is getting nice and melty and gooey. I would like it to be a little bit more gooey but maybe I put too much cheese on, <laughs> which is always a possibility because I am Sister Silver, hair goddess of the cheese. If you miss any part of this, apparently I am told that the uh, video will stay on Good for Spooning and you can watch it anytime you want. So I like to cook, to crack my eggs into a bowl first for a couple of reasons. First of all, I wanna make sure that there's like no weird anything going on with the egg. And also in case I accidentally pierce it too hard and I crack my yolk, I'm not putting it on the sandwich, you know, having to clean out the pan. I just do it in here and then just very gently dump it into the pan. Now this egg was sitting at room temperature for a little while, so it's kind of spreading out a little bit. So we're just gonna kind of push our yolk back together. Her sister Nancy's having issues again. Her cheese is not melting. Her cheese isn't melting? It's okay, Nancy, don't panic, it'll be fine. She covered it. You covered the sandwich? <laughs> Monty wants to know if it's best to have the eggs at room temperature. It, you know what, it's a personal preference. Restate the question. Um, I... Restate the question. My friend Monty wants to know, is it best to have the eggs at room temperature? It's a personal preference. 
I put my eggs at room temperature for this particular thing because I was laying everything out ahead of time. If you are doing something where you need volume, like a meringue or a souffle, yes, you absolutely positively have to have them at room temperature. But for this, it doesn't matter. Dave Trudell. Dave Trudell? Hi, Dave Trudell. <laughs> a lot of high schoolers on here. So we're cooking this egg really slow, really steady. We have a checker sandwich. Look at how beautiful that is. See it? Nice. And your pan, if you're doing this correctly, your sandwich shouldn't be so hot that you can't touch it with your hand. Or maybe my hands are just dead from touching hot stuff. But <coughs> it's, see, John, can you tilt that down? Because I don't want to tilt the pan. But the egg is just starting to solidify. My whites are just starting to solidify. We're gonna push them together. Or if you don't like that, you could alternately pull all of this out and just use that beautiful part that's in the middle. It won't hurt my feelings and it won't hurt the egg's feelings either. Zach wants to know, is the egg goal to be runny or jelly-ish? The, Zach wants to know is the goal on the egg for runny or gelled. I want my yolk runny and my whites cooked. Um, because it's going to go on top of the sauce. It's not going to go underneath mm -hmm. the sauce. Sorry, I screwed up and had my fingers in that shot when I was cooking that. <laughs> That's okay. My husband apologizes for his finger. Marie Schuess, Martha Schuessler. Martha Schuessler. Hi, Martha. Okay, so we're in the home stretch now. So while we're waiting for our egg to do its thing, and we're waiting for the remainder of this sandwich to get gorgeous, um, and I'm going to... And Sister Nancy to catch up. And wait for my sister Nancy to catch up. Um, and this was her idea, you guys, so... Um, I'm going to let you guys have an opportunity while we're waiting for everything to come together to make some suggestions about what you want to learn how to make. Now, of course, because this is my sister Nancy's idea, if she doesn't want to learn how to make it, I'm never making it. You could talk to me privately about it. But I'm not gonna demo something that Nancy doesn't want to learn because this was her idea, okay? So this is a definitely Nancy and Leanne production. Um, Nancy says, I'm full of great ideas and other things. <laughs> My sister Nancy says she's full of great ideas they and can, other things. They can see that. Yeah. Well, not everybody might be watching what's going on on the, the feed. So, um, so if you've got suggestions, I mean, Karen um, Shalita actually asked in the discussion on the page, on the event page, can we make suggestions? Yeah, you can make suggestions. I can't promise I'm going to make them. But you can make all the suggestions that you like. So the idea of this is to do a recipe that sounds complicated or looks complicated, but it's really kind of easy. Or something that takes 30 minutes or less to make. We're coming up on almost an hour now with all my conversation. Caprice wants to know if she has to put an egg on. You do not have to put an egg on, Caprice. I know you hate them. Um, if you leave the egg off, it'll just be a croque monsieur, and that's fine. Oh, Nanette finally joined in. Mark Farris is in. Oh, God. A bunch of people from Texas are ch chiming in right now. My friend Nanette and Vic's husband, Mark. Um, so, back to the suggestions. It is intended, because this is Quarantine Kitchen, to use things that are easily available or already in your pantry and that don't take a ton of time to make. What's the question, John? Um, Tom Reynolds wants to know how much wine is needed for this recipe. Tom Reynolds wants to know how much wine is needed for this recipe and that is entirely up to you. I had three shots of brown liquor before we started, so Kelly, we're good. Kelly Pearson's in also. Kelly Pearson. Hi, Kelly. A lot of high schoolers, man. Geez, you must have missed me. <laughs> this is the first time 
that I have had hair or makeup done since March 15th. My egg is almost ready. Okay, so now we're gonna get ready to start plating. Here's my beautiful plain white plate. You can use any plate you want, but this is the one I'm using. My parsley garnish is off to the side. Now, because my sandwich did not cook evenly, I ended up having to lo lower my temp. See, this even happens to everybody, but we're gonna cover this side with sauce so I'm not overly concerned. Right into the middle of the plate. I'm gonna angle the camera down. John's gonna angle the camera down so that everybody can see what I'm doing. We're gonna use a ladle. Oh, Miss Honey Bouquet finally. Honey Bouquet, my favorite drag queen. Oh. <laughs> I won't tell you the others. Oh God, there's people watching that are gonna scare me. Oh, they're not scary people. He says they're not scary people, but I might be scared by them. He's keep trying to give me a running tab on who's watching and who's not. Okay. So, I like to put my sauce on very slowly. And I like it to run just over the edge, like the perfect um, pancake shot for syrup. So I probably put on roughly half a cup of the bechamel sauce on there. Here's my egg and it's gorgeous. Now remember, I'm gonna take out the extra white. I'm gonna try not to break my yolk when I do this because that's the whole point. And then we're just gonna take a little bit. If you're really smart, you'll do it in a perfectly straight line. I'm not really smart. Guess what, we're done. You just made one of the most popular French brunch dishes ever. You did it. Now, you've got leftover bechamel. So I'm gonna talk a little bit while we wait for everybody else to catch up. Uh, you've got leftover bechamel. In case, and, and if you want your super saucy and you use more bechamel, that is fine. How's that? Does that help, babe? No, that's fine. Okay. I'm angling it back up oh, okay. so I can get you in the shot again. And my, my egg is sliding because <laughs> I tilted the plate. Um, if you have extra bechamel left over because you sauced conservatively like I did, you rewarm it. And if necessary, add a little bit of milk to thin it because sometimes when it cools, it thickens. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Add yourself some Swiss cheese. You've just made yourself a Mornay sauce. It's great on chicken. You can use it to bake like a chicken casserole with rice or, excuse me, uh, egg noodles or even elbow macaroni. If you want to make like a super fancy tuna casserole, use this. Use your Mornay, which is with your cheese in it, and your tuna and you're good to go. The other thing you can do is just use it to do a small batch of mac and cheese. If you've got little kids at home, super simple lunch. Throw in some cheddar cheese, whisk it, add, I like to add a little dry mustard, a little cayenne pepper when I'm doing mac and cheese, and it just kind of amps it up a little bit, and there you go, you got macaroni and cheese. Now, I happen to love Maldon salt, which is crunchy and it gives a little bit of extra texture to my sandwich. I can't believe my egg is tilted so bad because I tilted the plate. I thought it was going to stick a little bit better in the sauce. So, um, and yes, in case you're wondering, that's all salt, all different kinds of salt because I am a saltaholic. So, when you cut, oops, sorry about that. When you cut into this, and I'm gonna. All right, I'm gonna angle down again. John's gonna angle down for us. When you cut into this, you wanna make sure you get across that yolk. Can you see how nice that looks? My yolk is nice and runny. My cheese is nicely layered with the sandwich. We're gonna, I know Caprice hates that runny yolk, but that's okay. She's not eating it. So 
It's not as pretty as Thomas Keller's. But I will tell you, I'm really proud of myself because literally, this is the first time I've ever made it. Ever. Babe. So I got to pass so that my husband can try it too. All right, so what are your suggestions? What do you want to learn how to make? Nancy and I talked about doing manicotti, stuff shells. We talked about doing um, a chicken pot pie casserole. We talked about doing what? Your Is it good? Yeah. Yeah, John says it's good. All right, winner. Um, we talked about doing pasta puttanesca, mm -hmm. which has a great story behind it and has some scary ingredients in it that taste fantastic. Um, there's and again, if these if this series goes well. And I have enough people interested. And I know Lori Myers, Kim Spence, and a bunch of other people will be very happy to have uh, Grandma Nettie's world famous chicken salad recipe. We'll do that. Um, so you guys just gotta tell me what you wanna do. And oh, by the way, I kinda blame Nina Manchev and Jolene Menina for this too, because Nancy saw what Nina was doing and said, Leanne, you should do that. You're really good. So, I don't know that I'm really good, but I hope I gave you a lot of information. What questions do you have for me? Um, Jesse wants to know uh, why don't we share what means the most to you? Jesse Moreno. Oh, hi, Jesse Moreno. Karen Shalita was asking um, maybe an instant pot recipe since that's simple. Okay, so can. Jesse Moreno, who is a fabulous chef. Um, and I have been delighted, honored, and pleased to eat his food on numerous occasions, asks that I share recipes that are meaningful to me, and my sister Nancy and I will work on that together. Thanks for that great suggestion. Karen Shalita um, suggested, since so many people have Instant Pots, that why don't we do an Instant Pot recipe? I have one on tap for that, and Nancy and I will talk about that as well. Lisa Colorusco McCarthy asked, how about paella? Lisa Calaruso McCarthy, a high school buddy, would like us to do paella, and I'm going to say no. The ingredients are sometimes difficult to find in smaller markets because you have to have bamba, arborio, or carnaroli rice. Um, saffron in some markets is very difficult to come by unless you order it online, and it's really not a quarantine kitchen recipe. However, if you do want to see a quarantine kitchen version, Rick Moonen did one. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, chicken Marsala. Chicken Martha. Marsala. Who said that? Martha. Martha Schusler mm -hmm. wants to do Chicken Marsala. That's an easy one that a lot of people can totally get behind. So, again, Nancy and I will discuss that. Kelly Pearson said summer grilling and grilling veggies. Okay, that's a great idea. Kelly Pearson suggested summer grilling and vegetable grilling, you know what? It's really easy to do, and with the produce coming in now and throughout the summer, that might be a great option. And um, Carrie Hanscom uh, said marinara sauce, because she's got tons of tomatoes. Okay, so my friend Carrie Hanscom, Hanscom, hmm, Carrie, who lives in Arizona right now, suggested teaching how to do a marinara sauce. Well, I can do that. It's going to take you more than 30 minutes, so you're going to do some of it off camera. But I can totally teach you how to do that. Nancy makes a decent marinara. Or, as the people from back home say, marinara. <laughs> and Becky Tate said uh, a ta favorite Italian dish. Becky Tate, again, uh, Cordon Bleu graduate, suggested a favorite Italian dish. We talked about Marsala, stuffed shell, manicotti, chicken, chicken piccata is another great one. That's one of my favorites, one of my husband's favorites. I will tell you a little story though. I happen to love flounder franchise. And every time I've made it throughout our 33 years of marriage, a fist fight or plate throwing or screaming match has broken out. I never make it anymore. Period. End of conversation. Donna Shiel said chicken soup. Donna Shiel suggested chicken soup. You know what? A lot of people really don't know how to make that. Um, and it's so freaking simple. Like anybody can do it. 
So yeah, that's, you know, again, Nancy is in charge of that particular portion of this train. And Capri said bacon, mac and cheese. Caprice wants to do mac and cheese. Crack and cheese is Nancy's famous dish. She uses Martha Stewart's recipe. Caprice suggested adding bacon to it. In case you don't know, I smoke my own bacon, so yeah, that was, I'm happy. That was also a suggestion that came what? from doing your bacon. Oh, Jeannie. so it, yeah. Jeannie wants, my, my dad's wife, Jeannie, wants me to share how to do bacon. Look, it's a six-day, seven-day process. You have to cure it, flip it. Rinse it. You, know, you can't do that in 30 minutes. There's a lot for the chicken salad. Um, Kim Phelan Meyer mm -hmm. baking. I'm sorry, Kim ba what? Kim. Yeah, Kim Phelan. Said baking. She wants baking. You know what? I hate baking. I'm, here's the thing. Cooking is science. It, it's Baking is like chemistry. This is more like art and science. Baking is so precise, it requires big time attention to detail, and there's no way I can do that well and talk to you at the same time. Zach Ellis said pizza. Zach, you know what? I just now, Zach wanted me to do a pizza. I just got a recipe from a fellow culinarian in San Francisco where it takes 30 minutes to rise the dough. I'm going to test it, see if it tastes decent, and if it does, that might be an option for all of us. Dan Mixick? Dan. M-I-K-S-I-C? Oh, yeah, that. Hey, it's Chef Dan. Chef Dan from our European cruise is watching. Wow. What was his question? Oh, he just he just best regards from oh, Serbia. He's in Serbia right now. He is fabulous. So if you want to know more about him, go check out my blog about our European cruise because he was amazing. Oh, Eric wants lemon bars. The lemon bar recipe is on my website. Anybody can make it. Just hunt it down. All right. You ready to sign off? I am ready to sign off. Come here, my fabulous husband. He is the producer and director. Thanks, and, everybody. And if anybody was wondering, yes, there is a casting couch. So if she ever wants to work in this town again. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.